a, a pleasure um, to introduce um, Alia Binali from uh, University of Tübingen. And um, she is really on some very important ba basic research uh, also about TMS mechanism and a lot of electrophysiology in, in, in rodent models. And yeah, she's gonna talk about the neurophysiological basis of transcranial magnetic stimulation and so on. Um, I, I just hand it um, over to you. So as Alex mentioned before, I'm working at the Hertie Institute for Clinical Brain Research and at the Center for Integrative Neuroscience in Tübingen. And I'm really interested in to understand what is the neurophysiological base of transcranial magnetic stimulation. And before I forward with the talk, I want to say that we have no financial conflicts of interest to be close here. So, um, and um, as I said before, I'm working with the transcranial magnetic stimulation and I want to understand more the physiology. And TMS is a non-invasive stimulation, as most of you know, and um, it is used in humans in the treatment of many diseases. It is FDA approved and especially for depression. But, um, but the TMS has a, a problem because a central problem that is, if you can see here, if we apply TMS to the cortex, then the cortex is like a black box. We cannot see what is going inside the cortex and we can only measure in humans the response. This could be like a motor evoked potentials or if the treatment works in the, for example, in depression, if the mode of the patient improves, yes or not. But we do not know how TMS interacts with the brain at the level of single neurons and microcircuits. And um, in this will lead also to a high variability between the TMS studies. But to study the brain circuits is important to use in the gold standard is extracellular electrophysiological recordings, but the problem we apply um, a high magnetic field to the uh, system and we want to record a very tiny um, signal in the range of microvolts, but we apply a magnetic field in the range of 100 of um, up to four Tesla. And as you can imagine, this will induce to interferences. Therefore, we, the goal of our group was to establishing a platform to develop an extracellular electrophysiological recordings to study the team as evoked normal activities without or with a minimal time loss. To do this, you can see here, this is a TMS induced artifacts. That means the amplifier, um, that is the, how the TMS interacts with the amplifier system. This is an artifact that is recorded differentially with, um, with, an, um, with an input, uh, with an amplifier um, that has, um, that, um, that is, um, that is, that, can tolerate high voltages. And you can see in the green line here, this is the input range for a standard electrophysiological amplifier. And you can see that a normal amplifier is saturated for more than 30 milliseconds. That means in this, during that time, we have no data and the system is inactive. The TMS artifact that you see here is not just one artifact, as our study shows, it's a composition of several artifacts. This is what we call induction artifact, electrical field coupling artifact, which has two components, a fast component and a, um, a long lasting component and also vibration artifact. And in our group, we try to find a solution for all these types of artifacts. The first artifact that we studied in detail was the induction artifact. And you can imagine if the, if the, if the current goes through the coil, then um, it produces this B field and this B field will also induce some currents in your recording system. To overcome this problem, we developed an amplifier that attenuates this induction artifact. And this is an amplifier that is built up in many stages. We have a pre-amplifier. This is a simplified circuit that gets the differential signals with two electrodes. 
And um, um, a high gain filter amplifier stage that is shown here where the signals can be amplified because it's also more, we have to amplify it. And these filter, um, this high gain filter amplifier stage has been to pro protected by the DMS pulse. And therefore it is controlled by a solid state switch that can be adjusted um, according to a time time that is chosen by the users and this switch is controlled optically to reduce the artifacts in the system um, yes can be reduced and this can be adjusted by a computer outside and um, after after the development of this amplifier we have also a low gain um, um, a low gain channel where we can observe the artifact that we are uh, recording. Um, after the development of the amplifier, we thought we are done. We can start with doing the recording and study the direct effects of DMS. But this was not the case. A new artifacts occur. This is the electrical field artifact. We classify it like the um, um, classify it as an electrical field artifact. With the B field, we have an additional um, electrical um, an electrical artifact. And these also interfere with our recording systems. We have a fast component. This is for about 400 microseconds. And we have um, a long lasting artifact that polarize our electrodes for more than 30 milliseconds and makes this decay in the, this decay uh, waveform in the artifact. And um, to overcome this, we developed a coil shielding and this coil shielding attenuates the um, electrical field artifact, but we have to think about this coil shading a lot because the coil shading has to minimize the eddy current inside the shading to avoid vibration, additional vibration artifacts, and also it does not has does not attenuate the induction artifact. And we come up with a solution that is around 20, 10 kilo uh, 10 kilo ohm shielding for the coils. And another thinking that we had is also because due to this electrical artifact, we can also do some ICMS like a combination of electrical stimulation and magnetic stimulation. And to overcome this problem, we minimize the induction loops in our system. We have a compact arrangement of our electrodes and cable twisting, I think more or less everyone who is doing TMS is doing that. So with all this de development, we thought we are done, but this was not the case. We have an additional artifact. This was the vibration artifact that is shown here. But the good thing is now we are in the input range of the amplifier and um, of a standard amplifier. And here you can now see that this vibration artifact makes a lot of problems because it produces artifact that looks or waveforms that looks like a spike, but this is not a spike. And you can see we can get rid of this by using these low noise miniature coaxial cables. And the, uh, the good thing with this cable, they have an additional graphite layer between the conductor and the shielding. And this graphite layer reduces the triboelectrical uh, uh, artifacts in the system. So combining all these solutions together, we are now able to get a good recordings below the TMS um, coil. This is a standard electrophysiological amplifier. If you twist nice the cables and if you, um, if you use the coil shielding, then this amplifier can recover after 10 milliseconds after the, the TMS pulse. And with our system, we are around one millisecond or 800 microsecond after the, the TMS pulse, our system recovers. Now we wanted to use this system also and to cal calibrate and validate the system in an animal model. And we choose the rodent model because in these rodent models, these rodent models has a simple brain compared to the humans and to the primates. And we can reduce the parameter space in this animal model. And the other thing is that this animal model opens all, also the optogenetic parts and um, 
and the histology is also more possible with this type of animals. So therefore, we translate a human stimulation protocol back to the rodents. We use the single pulse DMS protocol. And before we started with the DMS, we wanted to get a good overview about the anatomy in this animal. We did intracortical microstimulation to map the motor areas of the rodents. And we choose the caudal forelamp area. This is the motor uh, area for the forearm movement in the rodents. And we position our electrodes like that, that the recording electrode is in the caudal forelimb area and the reference electrode is outside the caudal forelimb area. The recorded signal is then amplified, digitalized, and then sent to a recording computer and a control computer we use to control the TMS stimulator and the amplifier. And, um, and you can use each coil that you want um, without with this system, you do not have to develop new coils. And, the, uh, and we validated the system for the worst scenario. We used the monophasic and the biphasic stimulator from Maxstim, and we stimulated it with 100% motor output, machine output. And you can see nicely that you immediately one second, uh, one millisecond after the TMS pulse, you can record spiking activity with both stimulator. Um, so this is what I'm going to show you. This is some data from the motor cortex, from the forelimb area of the rodent recorded from layer four. You have here, this is a raster plot and um, it shows uh, it, uh, TMS is applied at zero at time zero, and you see nicely some spikes. Each dot is a spike. So you see some nicely some spikes around 20 milliseconds in the PSDH. You see that the peak amplitude is around 20 milliseconds. Then we have a time window we will have, where we have no activity, more or less the brain is silenced, and we find a rebound, what we call rebound excitation, that the activity comes back. And to be sure that we really record or uh, stimulate the cortex, we also did motor evoked potentials from the muscle of the forelimb area that is moved. And we, you can see here, this is the forearm contralateral to the stimulated hemisphere. You see nicely motor evoked potential recorded from the muscle. And in the ipsilateral, you see no activity because this arm also does not move. To verify and to be sure that this MEP that we record here is generated in the cortex, we also verify this in the same annual with a monophasic intracortical stimulus. And you can see that the latency onset between the ICMS and also between the uh, TMS is the, more or less the same. So, what now I'm going to show you, this is the um, this is the population average of our several animals and the, the PSTH is smooth, smooths a little bit just for visualization. And you can see in the inlet, this is the motor evoked action potentials from the muscle. And this is without stimulation. This is with sub-threshold stimulation, threshold stimulation and super-threshold stimulation. And you can see that in already, when the muscle does not move, we already have some activity in the brain around 20 milliseconds. We have an inhibition. And if we increase the stimulation intensity, you can see that the 20 millisecond component becomes more prominent. We have a longer lasting inhibition and we have what we call ex rebound excitation. And in the 120% um, stimulation, we have um, the signals becomes more, more, uh, more evident. And the disappointing part was that we have during the first six milliseconds, no activity. And um, this was something that we don't expect or doesn't, we didn't expect because based on this data that was shown in, in humans and in primates, who show that after the transcranial magnetic stimulation, you record some volleys that goes through the pyramidal 
pyramidal uh, pathway down to the spinal cord, and you record these events at the spinal cord with epidural electrodes, what is called D waves and I waves. In the sense of D waves, it is discussed that you directly activate the axonal, um, the axons direct that projecting down to the spinal cord, and I waves are generated inside the cortex. These are transsynaptically evoked, and if you remove the brain, if you if you remove the gray matter, then the I wave does not exist. So for us, two question arises. First, do we have the right animal model? And second, do we use the wrong stimulation um, current? To answer the first question is, we go back to the literature and Stuart and Al already show in the red, they expose the motor cortex of the animal, put a silver ball electrode and stimulate it the, with the silver ball electrode and record at the spinal cord the evoked potential and they could record a D wave and also a, I waves if they remove the gray matter the I wave disappear. So the quest, the, these men in these volleys exist in the rodents too. So then the second is could we do we not see the antidromic spike in the cortex because this happens in the first millisecond and we are still blind for this millisecond? Is this the case or do we use the wrong stimulation current? That's what we did. We did another trial of experiments where we change, where induce a current flow from posterior to anterior and these are the results is normalized firing rates in spikes per second. And you see that as for the ML orientation, we have a nice excitation inhibition and long lasting a rebound excitation, not long lasting rebound excitation, uh, excitation. And also in the first six milliseconds, you see if you increase the stimulation intensity that with this orientation, we also get a nice firing rate in this time period. That is a magnification of the first six milliseconds. These experiments are done in the same animals where we in, stimulate mediolateral or posterior to anterior. And you can see in the mediolateral orientation, we have more or less just like spontaneous activity, no increase in activity. But if we change to the PA orientation, we have nice cortical activation around 1.2 to 1.5 and around um, 3 and 4.2. Um, and this is the population. Um, average about many animals, and you can see that these I that what we call that I wave like pattern is all, are already present in the cortex, in in the average of between the animals. To conclude this, that a monophasic single pulse TMS evokes two different normal responses in discrete time windows, and this is a hint for a different circuits. The short latency time windows shows a high frequency spike activity. This is dependent on the coil orientation and it is also area specific. In the long lasting, um, in the long -lasting time window, we have a multiphasic spike rhythm alternating between excitation and inhibition. And this is independent on the coil orientation. The question is now this rodent specific or yes or not. And I would say no, because the work from Romerio that was published two years ago, she nicely showed the same effect in the primate perial cortex. And this was a monkey that was even behaving. And she could show that she has the same pattern, excitation, inhibition, and rebound excitation. And the group of Dirk Janka so, uh, also show with a different method that this exists in the visual cortex of cats. You see here an excitation peak. This is an inhibition and a rebound excitation. And if we have a careful look in humans, then you even see this pattern in humans too. So uh, I come to the end. I want to thank these people. Bing Shuli, now he's in the group of Rob Sima, did a lot of work with establishing the method in our lab. Johan, 
did the uh, develop the amplifier axle and did help us with the coil shielding and also with doing all the control uh, control experiments vision u and axle now working on on a multi unit uh, amplifier and Kathleen and Alex helped us with the simulation. And these three professors at our university helped us with the infrastructure and Connie and Martin helped us with a lot of discussion about the topic. So thank you. Um, thank you, Alia, for a great talk. Um, we have one question uh, from participants. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, you reported that um, you saw no spikes in the first five minute, five, uh, five milliseconds, sorry, after TMS pulse. The question is, would you expect to see any spike in the first five milliseconds in areas outside of the motor cortex, for example, in the prefrontal cortex? Um, this is something that I started to look, but at the moment I cannot say nothing about it. So, but I, I think if I see something, then we should see it in the motor cortex because this is the motor the cortex that we more or less direct activate. So, but uh, there we do not see for the ML orientation, for, but for the PA orientation, the activity is there. Okay, thank you. But I can check this if the prefrontal cortex has some activity, if we activate these neurons. I think prefrontal cortex is uh, maybe the most popular target for TMS after motor cortex.